In this video, I'll give an introduction to chemical kinetics and describe the rate of reaction. The speed of a chemical reaction is called its reaction rate. The rate of a reaction is how fast the reaction makes products or uses reactants. The ability to control the speed of a chemical reaction is important. So chemical kinetics is describing how fast reactions happen. And the rate of a chemical reaction is generally measured in terms of um, either how much concentration of a reactant decreases. So we'll keep an eye on how much reactant we started with and watch how that changes over time. Or we can keep track of how much product is accumulating over time. Um, so the idea is that if we have some way to keep track of how quickly the reactant is getting used up, then we can uh, measure the rate of the chemical reaction. So the way that we would express that mathematically is that for reactants, um, we'll we talk about the change in the concentration of a chemical species divided by the change in time. And when I'm talking about a reactant, I put it, a negative sign in front of that uh, rate because reactants are going to change um, in that they disappear over time. So when I uh, am talking about the change in concentration, it's always final minus initial. And the time here, delta t, um, since I'm uh, moving forward, the final time is going to be larger than the initial time. So that will be positive 2. So in order to indicate that um, I'm losing these, this concentration or I'm losing reactants, we put a negative sign in front. So what that means is if I'm tracking, if I'm trying to keep track of how fast a reaction, a chemical reaction occurs, and I'm trying to watch the reactant, in this case maybe I2, and I start with 100% and I have some way to watch that percentage go down over time, then that's going to be the rate of that reaction. And again, just to signify that it's decreasing, we always put a negative in front. So if I were trying to watch how fast a chemical reaction occurs, and I was watching that by conversely, by looking at product, let's say I2 is the product of a reaction. In that case, if I'm saying I start with 0% of a product, and over time it gets larger and larger and larger until maybe I get close to 100% of product, then the rate is going to equal positive change in concentration divided by change in time. So negative is referring to loss of reactants, and positive is referring to the increase in products. Here's a chart that shows how a concentration of a reactant might change over time. So we start with one mole per liter of H2O2. And when I take the first snapshot before the reaction starts, I know that I put one mole in there. It's one molar. And then six hours later, this is time in hours, six hours later, I measure the concentration again. The concentration has decreased to 0.5 moles per liter. So six hours later, at 12 total hours, I take the concentration again, and now it has decreased again to 0.25. Six hours later, 0.125. Six hours later, 0 0.0625. So you can see that at the beginning of the reaction, I start with 100%. And I have 50%, and then 25%, and then 12.5%, and then 0.0625%, and so on. Um, so, the in, in this case, this is how this is uh, how long this reactant takes to run out, right? And although it is getting cut in half every time, 1 to 0.5, and then 0.5 to 2 to 0.25 and then 0.25 to 0.125, so it's always half, 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 half. Um, this first time, that half represents a much larger quantity, doesn't it? Because half of this first one is 0.5. So in six hours, I lose 0.5. But in the next six hours, although it's true I have lost half, in the next six hours, I only lose 0.25. And in the next six hours, I only lose 0.125. And in the next six hours, I lose 0.0625. So I'm losing, every six hour period, I'm losing less and less and less. So what that means is that at the beginning of the reaction, the reaction is going really fast. I'm using up H2O2, I'm using up reactant really quickly. 
but by the end of the reaction, I'm uh, uh, the rate of re of product or the rate of reactant is is changing much slow, much more slowly. So um, what that means is that when we try to represent the rate of a reaction in, on a graph, and on this axis we talk about the concentration of H2O2, so how much I start with and how much I end with, the change in the concentration. And this could be reactants or products. And on this axis we're talking about how long it takes. So um, the change in reactant and how long it takes for that change to occur. So we'll see, we can see that generally this is the shape that that curve takes, where it's not a straight line, and it's um, not a line that uh, is decreasing very slowly at first. So you can see that it's kind of like at the beginning of the reaction here at 100%, at time zero, at the beginning of the reaction, the concentration drops really quickly, but then at about six hours, look, it starts to kind of slow down a little bit. The, the curve is, the slope is decreasing. And here it, it starts to slow down a little bit more. And here it starts to slow down a little bit more. And if I keep tra keeping track of the reaction and I go past 24 hours, then I'd see eventually that this curve it would start to get even flatter. And then eventually it would become totally flat. And when it becomes totally flat, it's not necessarily at zero, maybe it is, but maybe it's not. The point is that when that curve becomes flat, and it always will for every reaction we watch, it will always, the reaction will always start quickly and, and at some point it will stop, and it stops when it becomes flat. This flat part right here is called equilibrium. So every reaction will always come to equilibrium like this. It might happen at zero. It might not happen at zero. It might happen really quickly that the reaction comes to equilibrium. It might take more than 24 hours for the reaction to come to equilibrium. But every reaction will always come to equilibrium, a point where um, when it becomes flat, it'll always keep moving this direction because time never stops, right? So we'll always keep moving this way forever and ever and ever. Um, but if it's flat, that means that it's no longer changing in this direction. And if it's no longer changing in this direction, that means that the concentration has stopped changing. So at equilibrium, the concentration stops changing. So we can, when we're tracking a reaction, we can track how fast it's occurring by watching how fast the concentration changes over time. And we'll get a curve that looks like this. So we can see a couple of things here. When I take the tangent to the curve, and remember a tangent is a straight line that touches the curve at one point. So you can see here at this point, this is the point at which this straight line touches the curve. And here's a point and right at that point, this is where the straight line touches that curve at the point. So we can calculate the slope of this tangent to the um, rate curve here. And this gives me what's called the instantaneous rate. The instantaneous rate of a reaction is different than the average rate. So I could look at how long this has taken over 24 hours and talk about what's the average rate of change. Remember the first six hours was 0.5, the next six hours was 0.25. So what that means is that in the first six hours the rate is really fast, but in the last six hours the rate is much slower. So the initial rate of a reaction is generally much faster than the rate that occurs later on. And there's a very good reason for that, because at the very beginning of a reaction I have 0% products all of the particles that are in the reaction that are bouncing around, they're all reactants. So if they're all reactants, there's a very good chance that reactants are gonna bump into each other. But as the reaction proceeds and those reactants bump into each other and they create products, eventually there's more products bouncing around in the reaction. There's fewer reactants bouncing around in the reaction. So the chance that those reactants are gonna bump into each other 
goes down because now the, those reactants might bump into product particles and they're wasting valuable time doing that. Every time a reactant particle bumps into a product particle, it's not making it a chemical bond and it's not part of the reaction. So that's the reason that every reaction starts out fast because there's no products to get in the way. And by the end, when I've accumulated a lot of product, it's really hard for those reactant particles to find each other anymore. And at some point we reach equilibrium. And at equilibrium, some of those reactant particles might be left. And they might, even if they do hit each other, there might not be enough energy left or the probability that they're gonna hit each other is equal to the rate at which they are falling apart. So the, the, the concentration of those products isn't gonna change. If I gain one for every one that I lose, then the concentration stops changing. So um, if I take the rate over the entire curve, I would call that the average rate of the reaction. But that's not a very good representation of the rate. Because at the very beginning of the rate, it goes, at the beginning of the reaction, it's, the rate is fast. In the middle of the reaction, the rate is medium. And at the end of the reaction, the rate is slow. Until finally, the rate stops and I've reached equilibrium. So if I take the average of this entire curve and I say, the rate of this reaction is x, then it's not a very good representation because somebody might say, well, what's the initial rate of the reaction? And somebody might say, well, what's the rate of the reaction? You know, how long does it take for the reaction to come to equilibrium? And those are important things to consider. So we have the um, average rate where I look at every point along the curve, but an, another important point um, value is the instantaneous rate. And so a way to think about the average versus the instantaneous is by thinking about like um, the miles per gallon that your car gets. So my car has this gauge and when I'm driving down the road, I can push a button and it tells me what the, um, what the mileage is for my car at that moment. It says I'm getting 43.2 miles per gallon. And then maybe um, I start, uh, I'm on the freeway and I start getting better mileage. So then it goes up slowly and, and eventually it says I'm, go I'm getting 43.3 miles per gallon. Um, but it goes up very slowly because it's taking the average miles per gallon of my entire trip. So I might start in Coos Bay and end in Eugene and right when I pull into Eugene, my miles per gallon says 45.2. And so that's the average mileage that I got over the whole trip. But sometimes I was getting good mileage on the freeway and sometimes I was getting bad mileage on the going through town. So sometimes the reaction goes really fast at the beginning and sometimes it goes really slow at the end. So when I take that, that um, the mileage of my car as an average, it tells me something important about how the mileage that I got for that whole trip, but it leaves out important details. So the instantaneous rate, if I push another button in my car, it'll tell me what the mileage is at any moment. So that one doesn't move slowly. That one jumps around all the time. I'm going down the freeway and it goes 53.2, 53.5, 53.8, 52.7. And then I slam on the gas and it goes way down and it goes 23.4, you know, and it's dropping and it's dropping. And then I start coasting and then it starts going way up. And so the instantaneous mileage on my car is the mileage at any given second, or you know, it's a very small amount of time. And that gives me important information too. If I'm going up a hill, then my mileage is gonna drop way down. Or if I'm trying to go fast, my mileage is gonna drop down. And if I'm coasting or I'm going downhill, my mileage is gonna go up. So that information is lost in an average rate. And that's the kind of information that I can get in an instantaneous rate. So averaging all the points on the curve gives me important information about the rate of that reaction. But solving the tangent and just making this one line and solving for the slope of that line so that I can determine what the instantaneous rate is at any given point along the curve, that's also important information. So here's an example of a reaction. H2 plus I2 makes two HI. So H2 molecules are floating around and I2 molecules are floating around and eventually they bump into one of these, bumps into one of these, and a chemical bond is made and I make HI. So um, 
if I'm tracking the rate of this reaction, I can keep track of H2 and I2 and watch how quickly they disappear. It doesn't matter which one I keep track of because the, guess what? They're going to change at exactly the same rate, the H2 and the I2. And there's a really good reason for that. The only time that an H2 molecule is going to disappear is if it bumps into an I2 molecule. So every time H2 disappears, I2 also disappears because they, the reason they're disappearing is because they're bumping into each other and they're turning into product. And so they no longer exist. Now they have become product molecules. So I could watch how quickly H2 disappears, or I could watch how quickly I2 disappears, and it would be exactly the same, the rate. And if I watch how quickly HI appears, it will also be almost exactly the same, because the only way that HI can appear, the product, is if H2 and I2 bump into each other. So every time these bump into each other, they'll disappear, and at the exact same instant, two of these will appear. So if I'm watching the rate as a, as a function of the disappearance of H2, then this is the way that I would calculate that. Negative 1 over little a times the concentration, uh, or the, the change in concentration over the change in time. So the way that I will, um, that we interpret this equation down here is we think of an equation as looking like this. And remember, the lowercase letters represent the stoichiometric coefficient uh, that belongs with that reactant or product. So this reactant doesn't have a number in front of it, and this reactant doesn't have a number in front of it. So we assume that there's ones there. So then um, little a equals one, and big A equals the, the chemical itself, so H2. Little b is the coefficient of the next reactant, so 1 in this case. Big B is I2 itself. So then we have products. 2 is the value of little c. That's the stoichiometric coefficient. That's what these lowercase letters are. So 2 is little c. And capital C is HI. And there is no second product, so there's no d in this one. So then th the way to calculate, if I'm watching this um, chemical reaction change, and I'm watching the uh, concentration of H2 disappear, this is how I would calculate that. 1 over little a, and a is 1, little a is 1. The change in concentration, so I'd have to get some numbers for that, over the change in time. So I'd have to get some numbers for concentration and time. That's equal to, because remember, these are changing at the same rate, so it's equal to 1 over little b, and little b happens to be 1 times the rate of I2, the change in I2, over change in time. And that's also equal to 1 over little c. It's also equal to the appearance of products. And remember, little c in this case is 2. Uh, and the change times the change in concentration of c over the change in time. So the rate at which H2 disappears, this will disappear. And for every one of these that disappears, two of these will appear. So that means the rate at which HI appears is twice as fast than H2 disappears because of that two. It's saying that twice as many of these appear. So the way that we capture that mathematically is by saying the rate of 1A is equal to 1, and the rate of 1C is equal to 1 half, 1 over 2, because uh, little c is, happen is happening twice as fast. And so in order for these values to be equal, I have to cut that rate. I have to change that number because little c is going to change at twice the value as, as little a. So I divide it by 1 over 2. The, this is twice as fast, so I multiply by 1 half. If this is 3 times as fast, because I had a coefficient of 3, then I would multiply by 1 third so that it would equal, so that these would all be equal to each other. So this is a really long story to get to the point that when I'm trying to track the rate of a reaction or measure how fast a chemical reaction occurs, it doesn't matter whether I'm tracking this or this or this or if there's another product, I can track any of them and I will get to the same conclusion every time. I will, I will track the same rate because they're all equal to each other, keeping track of the coefficients.
So again, the average rate is the change in measured concentration in any particular time period. So we'll, we'll get every point along the curve and average them all together. The larger the time interval, the more the average rate deviates from the instantaneous rate. So that just means, again, if I look at my the total mileage of my trip to Eugene, it's representative of something, but it tells me nothing about my mileage when I'm going up hills or down hills because it's an average of everything. So that information becomes lost. The more it deviates from the instantaneous rate. The instantaneous rate is the changing concentration at any one point on that curve. So I'll just take the po any one point and um, calculate a tangent at that one point and find the slope. So uh, before we were just looking at the a curve for the a reactant. So this plot that we're looking at now shows the rate of reactant, NH3, that's this one here, and it also shows the rate of product, N2 and H2. We have two products in this one. Notice how the product curves have a different shape. The reason is because I start with 100% reactant, and as the reaction goes on, I it goes down, 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 and gets close to zero. Products, at the beginning of a reaction, I have zero products. So products start at zero, and over the course of time, my pro I get more and more and more and more and more and more and more products until I get to close to 100%. So um, product curves have the opposite shape as reactant curves, and that makes sense. Reactants are disappearing, and products are appearing. So um, we can see that at the beginning of the reaction, they disappear faster for reasons we've already talked about. So therefore, for, reason, for the same reason, the reactants appear faster at the beginning of the reaction. As these bump into each other and create products, then I get lots of products really quickly, and then the products start to form more and more slowly until eventually, again, as these lines go flat, they'll all go flat at the same time. Right here at this point is the point after, what does it look like, a little bit more than 2,000 seconds. That's the point at which this chemical reaction has reached equilibrium. The reaction has stopped changing, and uh, it will. These lines will stay this way forever. They'll just stay flat Not, unless something, unless we add something to the reaction or change the equilibrium. The equilibrium is stable, and it will stay. Um, those concentrations won't change. So we can see that um, as we look at the uh, reaction curve for the reactant disappearing, we can calculate the instantaneous rate at any point. We can calculate the instantaneous rate at any point here for the introduction of react, uh, the appearance of products. So the reason that the product curves have a different shape is because this product curve, N2, there's, look at the coefficient on N2, there's only, there would be a 1 here. Look for the coefficient for H2, there's a 3 here. So we can see that that's reflected in the, the shape of these curves. The 3 happens 3 times faster, it changes 3 times faster, and it ends at a much higher concentration. But since there's only 1 N2, the N2 changes slower, and uh, it ends at a much lower concentration. And there's two react, um, molecules of, of reactant. So that starts at a different height here. This is 3, 2, 1. And you can see they're about uh, equally spaced there. So you can see the, the stoichiometry reflected in the shape of these curves on a, um, when we're looking at these kinetics. So to measure the reaction rate, you need to be able to measure the concentration of at least one component in the mixture at many points in time. So there are at least two ways of doing this, but there's um, any way that we can use to track the change in products or reactants is a way that we can use to measure the rate of a reaction. So uh, continuous monitoring is a way that we can watch the concentration of a reaction change in real time. 
So it's like we put a movie camera in there and we can just watch every single molecule as it's changing and we can um, get updates every second or even faster than that on the, the real time changing of the, of the concentration. Polarimetry is a way that we can do that um, by, uh, with light, basically. We use a special kind of light, plain polarized light. Spectrophotometry is another way that we can do that with a different kind of light. Um, and we can also use pressure. If, we're monitor if it's a gaseous reaction, then the pressure of reactants and products um, is, is a function of their concentration, how much of them there are. So if we can monitor the pressure of a reaction as it changes, then that gives us insight into how those concentrations are changing. So this is the way that a spectrophotometer works. Uh, we use a source, a, a source light, and the light has lots of wavelengths in it. It's composed of many different wavelengths. So when the wave, when all of those wavelengths are passed through this first slit, we turn um, light that kind of goes all around the bulb in every direction, and we turn it into a thin slice of light. It just goes through this really tiny slit. And then the next step is to uh, is to break the light apart into its component wavelengths using something like a prism. And um, that white light is broken apart and we can see all of the wavelengths that make it up. So remember, just like light from the sun kind of looks white to us, but it actually consists of red and orange and yellow and green and blue and purple and infrared light and um, ultraviolet light and lots of different wavelengths of light. So the prism kind of breaks them all up into those different wavelengths. And then the next step is to um, put the, the rainbow of light through what we call a monochromator. And a monochromator, mono means one, and chromator means color. So a monochromator just lets one color through at a time. And so I can take white light here that has many, many, many different wavelengths in it, break it apart into lots of individual wavelengths, and then the monochromator is kind of like this. It's kind of like a slit again and it just selects one wavelength at a time, and it just lets one wavelength through at a time. And so then um, we put our sample in the instrument, and the monochromator kind of moves back and forth and lets one wavelength through at a time, and the detector says what happens. And it says, okay, monochromator says, I'm letting through red light at uh, 700 nanometers. And it passes through the sample, and the detector says, I received 80% of that light. Okay, and then it changes to the next color. Orange light at 650 nanometers, but it actually scans every single wavelength. So 700, 699, 698, 697, and it goes through every single, wave, every single wavelength of visible light, and it shoots it at the sample, and the detector says how much of that color gets through. 100%, 98%, 40%, 97%. So, it's, so some colors get through a lot, some colors don't go through very much depending on what's inside the sample and what's absorbing that color of light. So if we start with a sample that, um, a reactant that's very orange, then as we find the uh, color of maximum absorbance, maybe it would probably be like a blue color or something, complementary color. And so then we'd shine that blue wavelength through the orange uh, light, and as the reaction changes, as the concentration changes, then the detector will tell us uh, how much of that light gets through, and that's one way that we can measure concentration. Another way is um, through what we call a uh, gas chromatograph, and that's where we can inject a sample of our, uh, of our reaction. So this is not for continuous monitoring. In the other example here, we just can put a reaction here, and the reaction can be occurring in real time while I'm scanning it. So I can scan it and watch the concentration change over time. Here, I would have to put a little bit of the reaction in, and I would say, okay, here's a, rea here's a little bit of reactant of the reaction from 10 minutes, and put it in, and it'll go through the machine and say, here is the re here's the concentration um, reactants and products in your reaction. And then I would put another little sample in it for 20 minutes, and then take another little sample and put it in there at 30 minutes, and another little sample at 40 minutes. So um, this, these are called aliquots, when you take a little sample of a reaction.
So this is not monitoring in real time. This is not continuous monitoring. This would be um, uh, taking an aliquot and, and um, getting data points that are a little bit further apart. So we wouldn't have them, for example, every second apart because we're not recording in real time. But we could maybe take um, a sample of the reaction every five minutes or every 10 minutes or even every one minute and put it through the instrument. But the result will be that the intervals for our um, rate curve are going to be further apart if we do it this way.